get to talk about one of my very favorite people. Yes. <laughs> Sir, how are you today? Just fine. Yeah. Well, can I tell you very briefly what, it, oh. what the series is all about? I'm sorry, you've got to put up with a frankly ancient BBC setup. Do you mind? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just wondering about the two mics here. And yes. One's for you and one's for me. <laughs> all right. Um, eventually, it will be six programs about Mrs. Thatcher. They'll go out in, starting in May. So the time thing is, you know, things were happening, things that are happening today happened three months ago. And um, we imagine most of the things that you will want to talk about will go in the international program. But obviously, it's a marvelous box office for us. And so we will have you right up at the top and almost certainly in the last one as well. And uh, it's just a conversation. We'll just take it and see. All right, okay. Good luck. Ready? Uh, Mr. President, uh, Margaret Thatcher was the first NATO government leader, I think, to come to Washington to visit you after you became president. In f uh, she came, I think, in February '81, and people saw that as a symbol of your great closeness. Were they right about that? Well, uh, yes, we had known each other for quite some time. As a matter of fact, I was still governor of California, and she was not yet prime minister, but had become head of the Conservative Party when I first met her on a, a visit that I had made to London. And uh, we found ourselves in great agreement about a number of things that had to do with uh, international situation. And uh, I was very pleased and honored to uh, have her here as the first of the, our close allies, the NATO allies, uh, the head of state. And, and uh, I think it was symbolic of not only a personal relationship that had been established, but of the wonderful relationship that exists between our two great nations. What were the particular personal qualities you saw in her when you first met her as governor of California? Well, first of all, the wealth of information she had on so many subjects. She was uh, extremely well informed, but she was firm, decisive. Um, she had targets in mind of uh, where we should be going, and uh, uh, as I said, I was just greatly impressed. Now, I know that uh, there were some people at the time, conversationally, when I mentioned uh, how well I thought of her, uh, while I was still in London, there were uh, some people who um, uh, couldn't quite get used to the idea of a woman as prime minister. And uh, I doubt if there are many of those around anymore. Absolutely. You were seen, both of you, as the leaders, really, of a conservative revolution on each side of the Atlantic. Uh, was her having started this in Britain before you had the chance to start it here, was that, was that helpful? Was that important to you? Yes, very much so. Yes, I think, uh, uh, I think it was, uh, was an international happening, that uh, there was a reaction worldwide about her uh, becoming Prime Minister. You mentioned her as a woman, and that obviously was uh, of great importance in Britain. But at international gatherings, very male-dominated gatherings, the summits and so forth, how does that one woman stand out? Does it matter she's a woman? Um, <laughs> she is a great Prime Minister, not because she's a woman, but because of uh, what she knows, what she does, and, uh, and her insight into the right answers for the problems confronting us. And I have never seen any, uh, in any of our NATO meetings, our summit meetings, any lack of uh, respect and recognition of her stature uh, because she is a woman. You've spoken of her as an ally, but she's also been an opponent at times, hasn't she? She's had disagreements with you. Is she a formidable opponent? Well, let me just say this, that uh, I don't think any of the uh, disagreements have survived as disagreements once we uh, could talk to each other. They, some of them have been uh, the result of distance and uh, not having uh, heard the entire story uh, 
And when it is told, then everything is, is just fine. But uh, I know someone has asked me once about her as, as a negotiator. Uh, fortunately, we haven't had to negotiate. She would be most formidable on the other side of a negotiating table. But something like uh, the Grenadian event, where there was a very clear difference after you had supported her over the Falklands, there was a lot of feeling, I think, in America that she should have supported uh, Washington over Grenada. Uh, at the time, was that a hurtful event? Yes, and the, it was unfortunate at the time. My situation was not one of lack of trust in her or on your side of the ocean, but in this city of ours, Washington, there, the walls seemed to have ears. And I felt that it was so important in the limited time that we had to plan and move, just a few days involved from the decision to actually uh, the troops on their way. I was so fearful of a leak from our side that uh, I just put it on close hold because there were so many lives involved. And the minute we could, <laughs> I, I explained that to her, and that's what our, uh, what our situation had been and why I had made the decision I, I made. How would you assess her performance over the Falklands, her performance as a leader? I don't know how it could have been improved. I think she was faced with a very grim necessity. Uh, I knew something of that. Uh, I had spent 45 minutes myself on the phone with the then president of Argentina trying to uh, persuade him that uh, they should not be moving as they were. And uh, I didn't get any place. So I know that efforts were made uh, to resolve that peacefully if possible. Uh, not only by my trying to put in a, an oar, but uh, on the part of your own government. And uh, I think it was, I think it was well, uh, well handled, but I think it also uh, uh, was the result of her ability at decision and firm action. Do you think that the conservative revolution which you've both presided over, which we mentioned before, is one which is going to last? I mean, do, do you see it as having changed these two countries for the foreseeable future? I have to believe that it will, because I think probably both of our countries had gone through a period in which, in some ways, we lost faith in our own people, and uh, we began to turn back to government uh, doing everything and government being looked to for things that properly belonged out with the people and at the private sector. And I think there has been a recognition of that. Uh, I, I haven't been calling it conservatism so much anymore as common sense. And uh, yes, I think that we, I think we have made a, a turn and that uh, it'll be a long time and I hope never before people uh, see themselves reverting to this statism and this belief that government must uh, take over and do everything. And does it help the special relationship between our two countries, which you referred to, that you happen to have two leaders who are like-minded? I mean, you might not have. We might have a socialist. Would the special relationship survive that? Uh, well, I'm quite sure that the bonds between our two countries uh, would survive uh, any changes in leadership in these two countries. But uh, I think that it is helpful that uh, with the world uh, economy uh, so linked as it is, so internationalized, uh, I think that uh, with what has been a, a worldwide recession, for example, I, I think that uh, the working together uh, and seeing more or less eye to eye uh, between our countries, and this goes for our other allies in, uh, in Europe also and elsewhere in the world. I think it is most helpful, beneficial. Just going back finally to Mrs. Thatcher herself personally, in our country she's often thought of as somebody who lacks a sense of fun, a sense of humor. Now you visited with her frequently on both yes. sides of the Atlantic. I mean, have you any particular memories of, uh, 
uh, of her character, as it were, perhaps the, the sense of humor she might have. Yes, <laughs> and she does. And I have seen her uh, at the table in the uh, summit meetings as just one of the seven, and I have seen her presiding uh, at the meeting. And um, uh, her great good humor, and uh, as I say, her cutting through to the vital points. Uh, I'm, I'm being a little reluctant here about uh, telling something, uh, and I hope it won't be tactless of me if I tell it. But when we had the summit meeting here in our country, at Williamsburg, which, as you know, has been restored as the original colony that it was, and the first meeting was an evening meeting, dinner, to open the whole session, and it took place in what had been the British colonial governor's mansion. And I couldn't resist. I was all prepared that when we sat down that I was going to suggest that had one of her predecessors been a little more clever, uh, she might be uh, hosting that gathering. And so we sat. There was a moment of quiet before conversation broke out, and I said, Margaret, uh, if one of your predecessors had been a little more clever, she said, I know, I would have been hosting this gathering. <laughs> I never got to finish my, <laughs> my line. <laughs> Mr. President, thank you very much indeed. Well, a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that all right? Not uh, wonderful. Yeah, fine. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, all right. That's a marvelous come on when you, when you say um, I may be about to be a little tactless. <laughs> <laughs> everyone just <laughs> <laughs> well, I keep remembering a story that I once heard over there in one of your libraries in London, and he hadn't been able to find a book, a certain book about the United States, and he finally went to the librarian for help. She said, if you looked under colonies. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank, you very much yeah, thank you very much, John. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Goodbye. Thanks, President.